All right, folks. Uh, welcome to the uh, North Central Climate Science Center's monthly check-in. Uh, sounds like people are joining in, uh, and uh, see quite a few people uh, logged into the WebEx. Uh, if anyone cannot see the slides that should say overview and update on the USGS's resource for advanced modeling, uh, please speak up. All right, we'll assume, assume that uh, people can, uh, can see it. And uh, we're going to do a, uh, a round robin here on this talk. Uh, uh, the folks listed there, I did reverse alphabetical, reverse alphabetical so that Colin wasn't the last of this. <laughs> 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 but the people in the lower case, the alphabet, they kind of, you know, kind of show up last. So uh, just reverse, uh, reversing that. But we got, you know, this is uh, the four people who will be speaking. Uh, Colin uh, Talbert works at the Forecon Science Center uh, and helps a lot with the North Central Climate Science Center. Myself, uh, Jeff Morris at uh, Brian Miller works for the North Central Climate Science Center, and Amanda Cravens at the Mendenhall uh, postdoc at the USGS Forecon Science Center. And of course, this is a collaboration and information from a host of other uh, people. So we're the ones presenting, but it does represent uh, quite a few years worth of work about covering the kind of history section. We're going to dig into this, and as we usually do, is take about a half hour, 35 minutes with uh, kind of a science presentation, and then open it for questions, primarily with our foundational science areas, uh, and uh, with uh, having and asking all funded investigators to be on the call. Uh, of course, welcome to others as well, our stakeholder group and other uh, interested parties. So. Uh, with that, I'll be starting here with the, the overview uh, and, and kind of the, uh, then some others will give kind of more of the updates on what, what's going on. So um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, resource for advanced modeling uh, has been around for a while, since about 2009. I'm going to give a little history of what it is. We're going to talk about how it's been utilized for climate impact studies in the North Central Climate Science Center, <coughs> primarily. Uh, and then uh, in a social science dimension, kind of fit that into uh, <coughs> as a boundary object in the boundary organization uh, kind of school of thought with some, some details on a case study. And then moving on to kind of some technical specifications and sort of a RAM 2.0 that we're thinking of, modifications to the RAM and improvements. And then a general strategy for using the RAM. And kind of then that last part being kind of an open invitation for folks to contemplate uh, using the RAM or working with us on that. So the history of the RAM, uh, I'm going to show two slides that uh, are based on a paper Gordon Rhoda, Rhoda, Catherine Jarnovich, Bob Reed, published uh, uh, in PLOS One back in uh, well, 2011 that showed two different maps of uh, suitable conditions for the, uh, mainly for giant snakes in Florida. And uh, the, the thing is that um, you can see in the paper outlines how different background selection methods for the maximum entry, maximum entropy species distribution modeling can give you quite different results as far as you know, all of Florida being suitable habitat for uh, the, 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 the giant pythons or I think just generally large uh, snakes or a different background selection point gives you kind of just the southern tip and the western edge. And I think you know they make a case in the article that the background selection method for this model that shows more of the land was actually more more accurate or more uh, following the uh, the kind of uh, theory of what maximum entropy does in that background selection. And what we had, and I was branch chief for the invasive species branch, and we had we were exposed to a Freedom of Information Act and an Information Quality Act related to the pet trade industry kind of uh, thinking that this it, it should not be listed as an injurious species and therefore not uh, kept out of the country. And so that's just kind of a background story of my or our experience uh, in the invasive species branch and in USGS that you know these have, species distribution models have a lot of levers and, uh, and knobs uh, which can control you know kind of the output and I think you know kind of if you get species distribution model or enough time and uh, enough flexibility in what they, how they can parameterize, you could almost make an entire area suitable habitat or not suitable, depending on what you did. And But there are legitimate ways to do that. And it sort of led us to kind of strategize on, you know, maybe uh, 
collaborative workspaces to do this species distribution modeling instead of any automated system where you drag in a bunch of field points and you get a species distribution map. And I think those are perfectly fine. I think there's places out there that have those web tools to do kind of quick species distribution modeling. Uh, I think there's a hesitancy, at least there was with me and the Invasive Species Branch, to have a USGS logo on that map and say that this is a, uh, a USGS map uh, because, you know, you can tweak it and adjust it and that to, to kind of suit your purposes in some ways. Um, and that the, 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 there's an importance of bringing people around the table who know about the species, know about the, the predictor layers, know about the, the, the modeling. And so that was kind of the core uh, kind of impetus of starting, starting the, the resource for advanced modeling. And it started with Tom Stolgren, kind of see the back of his head here in that photo. Uh, it was started down the hall from that where that picture was taken in a smaller room and we had about 10 people in there one time and I think somebody moved their leg and unplugged the computer and <laughs> ruined three hours worth of modeling, had to restart. So we expanded kind of down the hall into the space that's shown there. Uh, it uh, you know, had a standard LCD, LCD projector, but it did have an ability to kind of swap laptops to show that uh, you know, what, on that LCD projector what was happening. We moved on then kind of in a uh, slowly then between then and now uh, to do uh, a visualization wall that you see here, uh, the software for assisted habitat modeling, uh, thanks in large part to Colin and Marion Talbert, uh, have made this real, real robust. It has a tutorial, it sort of has a, has a, uh, a Google group that can kind of, uh, kind of post questions and, and sort of users uh, uh, information on that software. Uh, we do training every six months. Uh, and uh, we also are exploring different modeling techniques. Uh, 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 the, 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 the Steve Hofstetler, uh, Meredith McClure project funded out of the Climate Science Center that's doing connectivity uh, did have a session in the RAM. They were using different modeling techniques and a lot of GIS over, overlays and we were able to bring that in. Brian's doing a lot with scenario planning and state and transition modeling. Marion's doing a lot with uh, graphics of climate data. Colin and Gabriel Sine are doing stuff on drought and the SNAP working group. All of those are kind of being considered for kind of what we can bring into the RAM uh, to, to, to take advantage of the, the mini cluster that we have there and then the visualization capacity there. Um, one of the things, this is sort of a detailed slide of that software for assisted habitat modeling. Uh, I think there's some terms in the literature that call it black uh, gray box modeling, where you peel off the black box a little bit and you still have some boxes, but they're kind of more exposed to what's happening in the workflow, uh, what parameters are being set, how they're influencing that workflow. Uh, and the VizTrail software that's, uh, you know, that the software for assisted habitat modeling is built into uh, is kind of, I think, a case of that gray box type modeling, literally and figuratively, that uh, it does allow you to kind of know the workflow and explore the parameters. It does give you a history of that parameter selection. So every time you change a parameter in here, it shows up as a different tray, a different node along that trail. And then even within the software, uh, you can see on your screen visualizations kind of in a, in a matrix kind of spreadsheet type approach. And this has lent itself very well to the 24 monitors. So imagine not just on a laptop, but across the 24 monitors, you can show the different output from the viz trails. And that's more, that's specifically for species distribution modeling. The SOM software is, but viz trails is kind of more generic and can take a data set. Uh, this was recognized sort of just as a resource for advanced modeling in 2008 uh, for the collaborative workspace in the DOI Partners in Conservation Award, uh, and then in 2009 and 2010 for actually some specifics that involved other people and other meetings and other uh, uh, partnerships, but in some part did use the uh, resource for advanced modeling for some of the modeling that was there. And then recently we won the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, got an honorable mention for the work we've done on the State Wildlife Action Plan. That's going to be mentioned later in, in some more detail. Uh, so with that, let me move on to utilizing the RAM for climate impact studies. Uh, I can pause though if there's any questions. Okay. So, uh, you know, at the heart of uh, the, the, the this is kind of generically kind of relating climate data to kind of the uh, you call ecological response modeling in a generic term. A lot of times there's point locations. 
there's climate and summaries of climate and how that climate relates to it. And this can be uh, parameterized mechanistic models, sort of knowing what people know about the plants or animals or habitats. This could be correlative or statistical machine learning type modeling, which is what the SOM software is. But in any case, you know, generically, there's an ecological response model that's bringing in some information from the field, whether it's calibration and validation for mechanistic models or it's just the data that's driving the machine learning. And then there's climate data that are forcing those models. And then there's an output which is extrapolated in space and time of the the uh, the, 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 uh, the target, uh, the management target being a species or a habitat. And so the belief is, and I've showed this slide quite a bit, I'm sure some people might have seen it, but that we believe that there needs to be the people that kind of were involved in those uh, general uh, pieces of information. Uh, they need to sit around the table, literally, and that's kind of what the resource for advanced modeling does. And so you get the people who were out collecting the field data, who understand the technology, understand the statistics, and then the managers, or at least the users, taking that data to the next step. And it's further analysis, if it's more a technical user, or it's the land manager who's making a decision. Um, so that's kind of how we're using it in the North Central Climate Science Center. I'm going to hand it over to Brian to talk about the uh, the RAM uh, as a uh, as a, in the in the context of boundary organizations and as a boundary object. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess to just kind of extend what Jeff was saying and to maybe put it in uh, a little bit different terms, uh, you know, the, the Climate Science Center uh, is sort of positioned as an organization that is uh, meant to kind of bridge uh, the management and scientific communities, particularly relating to climate issues. Um, and, and so in that sense, you know, we are a, a boundary organization, um, bridging sort of research and user or management communities. Um, and, and so uh, this bridging, uh, in effect, is, is what's called boundary crossing uh, in the literature. Um, and there's different forms of boundary crossing. Um, I've sort of thrown two of them uh, up on the slide here, uh, one being sort of producing knowledge together, co-production of knowledge, um, and, and as well as uh, just learning about each other's fields in order to do our, our own jobs more effectively within our own sort of spheres of influence. Um, and, and I'll say, too, I don't think that these uh, sort of types of boundary crossing activities are necessarily mutually exclusive or independent. Um, and they can, in fact, sort of happen together, um, as we kind of talk about here uh, with this example. Um, but in order to, to sort of cross boundaries uh, effectively, um, we need to kind of link that knowledge, that science, with the application um, in a way that is um, both credible, salient, and legitimate. Those are sort of the three key terms that are used um, to describe effective boundary crossing. And, and by that, I mean that you know, you're producing rigorous uh, knowledge. You know, the, the science is sound, um, or the information source is sound. Um, and of course, that information is relevant to, to the management needs. Um, and that would be the stock element of salience there. And then finally, there's an there should be an element of legitimacy in that there's some kind of fairness, there, there's respect, inclusiveness, and, and a lack of bias um, when, as that information is being produced. So those are sort of the three things um, that you really want to be shooting for and kind of linking knowledge to action. And through other studies, others have shown that really uh, the best way to achieve this sort of credible, salient, and legitimate knowledge co-production um, is through, uh, you know, a couple of, of elements. I've listed some here. Um, you know, having accountability uh, on both sides of the boundary um, and participation as well from both, both user communities, user community and scientific community. Um, and, and in doing this, you know, having this communication across the boundary, of course, there's oftentimes a need for translation. Um, people use different terminologies, uh, have different ways of thinking, conceptualizing things, um, and so often there needs to be some kind of translation between these different spheres. Um, and along with that is an element of coordination. Uh, of course, you know, you can't just um, kind of plot people down and expect things to, to sort of happen, um, but rather some kind of uh, deliberate coordination is often needed. And, and lastly, uh, is this idea of using boundary objects to facilitate um, the, the connection between knowledge and, and application. Um, and that's really what we're going to be focusing on here and, and, and what really relates to the RAM and why we've kind of brought all of this up um, in relationship to the RAM is that um, 
boundary objects can um, can serve multiple purposes and kind of bringing two people together um, and, and sort of tracking how knowledge is produced. Um, and, I, and I should say, you know, boundary objects is a term that uh, is fairly broad and, and generally relates to just any kind of infrastructure um, or tool that can um, help to, to bring groups together, that helps to bridge across that boundary. And so um, to kind of put a, a finer point on this and to make uh, these things maybe a little bit um, more uh, tangible, uh, we'll, we'll now kind of describe uh, the work that was done um, across the folks that you're hearing from today as well as a variety of others um, that kind of put the RAM to use and document that use of the RAM itself. And so this was um, uh, initiated uh, with the, the revision of the Colorado State Wildlife Action Plan, that's the SWAP acronym at the top there, um, and uh, the idea being that the, the State Wildlife Action Plan needed revision and climate considerations needed to be incorporated into that revision. And so uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, CPW, um, contacted the Colorado Natural Heritage Program to assist with this effort. Um, and subsequently, the North Central Climate Science Center was also brought in to kind of provide some expertise and information on, uh, on the climate aspect of, of this revision. Um, and I'll say that uh, this wasn't just, you know, work that went on in the RAM with a, uh, with a workshop, but rather there was quite a bit of work that had to be done in advance of that workshop session uh, with folks like Marion Talbert and Colin Talbert, um, uh, you know, sort of pulling climate data, organizing other data, um, running some preliminary habitat models, um, and preparing those for an in-person workshop so you could really hit the ground running. Um, and, uh, and I will add, too, that we also distributed surveys to participants before the workshop to kind of ask about their expectations uh, for the workshop itself, um, and also then followed up with people afterwards and asked how things, what their reflections were on the process. And then in the workshop itself, uh, we did have video recordings, and this, was, this work was sort of approved by the uh, Ethics Review Board here at Colorado State University, um, where we videotape participants throughout the workshop, sort of continuously running in the background. Um, but not, you know, trying our, our best to not be intrusive, not sort of interviewing people face-to-face -face on camera, but rather running that camera in the back. And then, of course, uh, there were members of the study team who were active participants in the workshop itself, so using our lived experience by being in the room to kind of interpret uh, the data after. And so uh, before I uh, pass it off to Amanda to really talk about uh, kind of what she found, especially through the video analysis results, um, I just wanted to kind of uh, orient you our sort of conceptual framework for this project. It's not only with the goal of producing the information that could be used in the State Wildlife Action Plan, but in terms of thinking about the RAM and how it's used, um, you know, we really wanted to, to one, bring together uh, kind of management and scientific expertise. Um, but also, you know, we recognize that we needed to work across um, scientific disciplines. So we kind of have two forms uh, of, of, um, uh, of boundary crossing here in a sense. Um, and so by bringing these, these different modes of thinking together and, and through using the RAM and coordination therein, uh, we wanted to both sort of co-produce uh, information together and sort of hone in collectively on, on what are the goals uh, that we're trying to achieve through this workshop process, and that's sort of this, uh, depicted by this inward spiral here on the left. And at the same time, uh, having people kind of learn and expand their knowledge beyond what they already know within their own disciplines, their own spheres of influence, and, and so that's what's depicted here by this outward spiral is that um, expansion in terms of our, our, our different ways of knowing. And so, uh, again, you know, our, our goal by using the RAM is to bring together the scientific and, and sort of more applied or practice-based knowledge that managers and habitat experts uh, could bring to the table and, and do so in a way uh, that was credible and salient and legitimate. So um, that's sort of our intent with the project. And uh, now I can pass it off to Amanda to, to really dig into some of the more uh, interesting findings from that work. Thanks, Brian. So I'm going to talk particularly about the video analysis because this conceptual framework that Brian was talking about really kind of pulled in that survey findings and lived experience. But the video analysis um, was the piece that really let us get into the detailed mechanism and really the what was going on in the room that let this boundary crossing happen. 
Um, and so for, I know there's some people on the phone who are familiar with this kind of social science analysis. For those who are not, um, what I did with this, I transcribed the video. So there's about 10 hours of video, um, produced a transcript of it, and then coded it. And those quotes came from a variety of literatures that we thought were relevant for this, as well as things in the video that we didn't necessarily know to look for before, but saw as they were there, and that's called open coding. Um, and then, as I'll talk about a little bit later, um, one of the things that emerged was what activities were going on, and so I coded it minute by minute for the activities that were happening. And I'll talk about that workshop flow in just a second. Um, and the objectives of this video analysis were really to identify at a short time scale what was happening at the level of people thinking and what was happening at the group dynamics and really that how that a collaborative group does these things. Um, and then to really think about the interplay between the group and the individual process because you have people sitting in a room and they are learning and thinking and processing information as individuals, but there's also, especially jointly producing something like a state wildlife action plan, there's something going on at the group level as well. And so this kind of detailed analysis, we were really hoping to look at that interplay. So the findings, this is a little bit of a dense slide, um, and I can talk more about any of these that you'd like to hear about in detail with the questions, but there were really three sort of categories of these mechanisms that we found. And the first two are mental. These are thinking things that are going on. So the first is under joint knowledge production. These are the four things we found that really let people produce a shared product. And in this case, it was that climate consideration that went into the wildlife action plan. Um, the first was that they defined the problem space in the same way. And they didn't do that initially. Um, you'll see in the workshop flow that they kept coming back to the goals and questioning the goals and refining the goals. Um, the second was what is thinking? This is literally saying, you know, what if we could do this? What if we could do that? And that sense of possibility, posing questions, answering them, often using the models in the RAM to answer them was one of the ways that, that thinking of the group advanced. Um, sometimes the evidence from the statistical models and the ecological data didn't say the same thing. And at that point, the group had to actually take that evidence and reconcile it, find a way to say, well, actually, you know, I think that there's a point here that's an outlier. I think that the statistical model is not accounting for this. Let's put another predictor layer in there. So that reconciliation really moved that joint knowledge production forward. And then, as Brian already mentioned, having shared mental models, sometimes literally shared vocabulary. Um, at the beginning of the workshop, people were using People who were not not ecologists, but some of the managers in climate science, or sorry, not um, some of the climate scientists, were using habitat and species as synonyms. At some point, one of the ecologists said, "You know, actually, we need to be more precise. Habitat and species are not the same thing." And as the group took that in, they refined what they meant by that. The second mental process we found is that second kind of boundary crossing that Brian was talking about. And that is when people are actually learning about different fields from their own. Um, and this, you have a couple of different things going on as well. Translating is literally when somebody is explaining things from their field to me in terms that I understand. So at one point, one of the climate scientists gave a presentation that she titled the presentation, this is a brief presentation, but she titled it Five Things that Climate Scientists Want Ecologists to Know. So she took the climate science and she put it in the ecologists understood it. Um, distinguishing one field from another is really becoming conscious of boundaries between the fields. Um, one of the managers at the end of the session remarked, you know, I really didn't understand about the things that climate scientists know and don't know. And so becoming aware of where those uncertainties were, that manager was better able to understand how to use that information in a rigorous way for management. Um, and then the third was the salience and credibility that Brian's already talked about. And then this third category are social. 
So you have these two kinds of mental processes going on, but these are people sitting in a room together for hours. You know, they're interacting socially. And these social processes are really supporting that thinking. They're very intertwined. And so these social things we really want to highlight because that intertwining is part of what makes this collaboration happen. Um, and so the four mechanisms we found there, psychological safety means that people feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable, to say things that make them feel a little bit stupid. When you are bridging into a field that is not your own, if I'm an ecologist working with a climate scientist, by definition, I'm not and so that the group created a tone where the ecologists and the climate scientists felt comfortable asking questions that sometimes could feel stupid. Um, reflecting group dynamics past the group. This is the role of a facilitator. And in the beginning, it was often the formal leaders who played so the project manager for the project, the uh, climate science center staff. But as the group took ownership of the project, it became almost everyone in the group who was saying things like, well, where do we go next? Well, wait, did we answer that question? Um, and I want to also highlight the role of the technical facilitation, because as Colin's going to talk about in more detail, this can be a pretty good system to use. And so having that technical facilitation of someone who's able to translate between what the computer is doing and what the group's thinking is doing is really important, especially in the current configuration of the RAM. Um, clear, active communication. This isn't surprising, especially for those who've taken communication training where people talk about things like I statements, expressing disagreement clearly, saying, you know, this is my opinion. But these are things that when I actually sat down and analyzed the video, it was there and we really found that it supported the collaboration. Um, and then humor. Again, this shouldn't surprise anyone, but that humor really brought the group together. Um, and these are all things that we also found support for in the organizational behavior literature. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about, as I mentioned before, I coded the video for what was happening during each minute. And these are not mutually exclusive. Occasionally there was two things happening at once. Usually computing resources were being worked with while discussion was happening. And I just want to ha highlight a couple of things here. First, we often think of defining objectives as the start of something. You define the objectives and then you do a project. This was iterative, and that's where we came up with the idea of spiraling in. Because on the top line, you see, that's the mouse here. So on the top line, you see, okay, you define objectives, you work off of that, and then three hours later, based on what you've learned in those three hours, the group comes back and re-examines their objectives and re-examines their purpose. And then at the end of the first day, there's been more learning. So they come back at the start of day two and they say, what did we learn yesterday? Where are we going next? And that iteration happens a couple more times. So that was something we identified that was important to this joint knowledge production. The second thing that I would highlight in this is that there's this cycling between discussion of how the managers are going to use the data, the climate science, and the ecological data. And it moves between these discussion topics. Um, and then the actual looking at the data on the modeling this trail software or on the visualization screens is also moving between those. You don't see it on this because it happened overnight, but there was more modeling that happened overnight. So some of this discussion is also taking place after more modeling. Um, the third point, and again, this shouldn't surprise anyone, but we did want to make it explicitly, is that this is a, requires quite a bit of technical infrastructure. And so there is time kind of all the way through devoted to making the technical infrastructure work. Um, and also the social glue of making sure that folks are saying, well, where, where next? Are we on track with this coordination piece? Even things like, well, do we need a break or do we want to keep working? Um, people need to keep coming back to it. And then the fourth piece, and this will kind of transition to what Colin's going to talk about, um, is 
that this really focuses on what happened in the room, but that the whole RAM, all of these RAM projects rely on what happens before and after or even in between days of meetings um, to really fun to make what happens in the room work well. So I'm going to turn it over to Colin. Any questions for Amanda before I continue? Uh, so, um, a couple times we've alliterate, uh, kind of referenced the process that this is embedded in. So we saw the, the, the flow during the, the workshop, but it's important to realize all of the effort that kind of sets the sideboards and gets the data ready um, and the modeling ready so that when uh, a larger group comes in, you can kind of quickly iterate over various models and data and, and kind of explore what that means. If you're really relying on kind of a real-time kind of blank slate, you know, the RAM is not set up to do that. And so what what is involved in that process? Um, usually, and, and Jeff's going to go into a formalized uh, overview of this, but, but usually there, there's kind of a kickoff session where we talk to a scientist or a, a manager, usually a, a very technically uh, involved person about what exactly, what, what nuts and bolts are we going to connect to obtain the data and start modeling against it. And in that process, we've actually started to narrow down the list of modeling options and modeling inputs that we're going to expose for a RAM session. So things like deciding which climate model uh, data sources we're going to um, have ready to go and, and which ones will maybe kind of back burner or uh, uh, turn off, which, which family of model is appropriate for the, the types of management questions that we're thinking about addressing in this uh, session. Um, do those data and other input data, do we, do we have everything we need to, to fit that initial model and does the output look you know, somewhat reasonable that we can kind of use that as a building block for subsequent uh, modeling within the RAM session. And, and all of these are, are kind of very important to the process, um, and they are kind of setting the direction that the, the RAM session is going to go. Um, but when we do that, we're usually doing that iteratively with a, a scientist or a modeler at one of the uh, organizations that uh, is going to be at the uh, meeting. And, and for, for uh, groups that don't have a very technical person, we can kind of fill more of that role. Other times people come kind of ready to go and we'll just kind of facilitate with data management or visualization. Uh, and then uh, the, the flow that we just looked at kind of comes through. We've got one to you know, two or three days of collaborative group work. Um, and then after that, we, we'd like to not have it be um, kind of we're done at that point and, you know, we'll kind of send you with static outputs, but actually deliver the tools to recreate that process and extend it. And I think the, the, the work that we did the Natural Heritage Program here in Colorado that, that we're describing here is a really good example of that where, you know, we had subsequent follow-up meetings with folks at the CNHP where we kind of, be, uh, you know, talk about like getting them set up with the, the data and the workflows or extending them. Um, in other cases, we've kind of worked with groups that are um, working on publications and reports to deliver kind of publication-ready versions of the outputs that we were producing as a group. Um, but all of that, it, it kind of is a much bigger context than just the, the two days that are, are kind of most publicly visible. But uh, important to realize that, that there is kind of this broader co context that, that uh, one of these RAM sessions exists. Um, and so I'm going to kind of switch gears and kind of talk about where we're at with the RAM right now and some of our tentative plans on where we'd like to go. Um, so, so currently, 
we, we have a visualization wall that we've built ourselves, and I'll use uh, a pointer for, for these parts. And it consists of 24 monitors bolted onto uh, our wall through an apparatus, and they are driven by six commodity uh, desktop computers. These are fairly powerful, but, but nothing extraordinary computers. Um, and then they are each uh, connected to a central controller to, to either run a small part of the modeling or visualization that would then get displayed in, on the biz wall. We also have a projector where we can have the modeling software or a presentation about the modeling uh, process going on. So we can kind of talk about these, these are the parts that go into the model. And when we click run on a laptop on the group space, we can have a tiled array of various model outputs or a single high resolution output that folks can gravitate towards and kind of explore some of the ramifications of changing model inputs or model parameters on the output. And I think it's a very good way to engage um, people at various levels um, of the modeling or technical spectrum on kind of what the meaning of, of various uh, data and modeling explorations, kind of how that manifests itself. But, but it's really based around having a, a central um, group workspace and kind of that open um, reform uh, session. Um, but that's the technical infrastructure that supports it. But what, uh, what we found is that, that our current technical setup has some limitations that it's important to be aware of. Um, central to that is usability. We, we use um, uh, software written in VizTrails or Python um, and MATLAB and Python specifically to create the visualizations that we're looking at. Now, a lot of people are not familiar with VizTrails for producing visualizations in Python. They might be using ArcMap to do their geoprocessing, R to do subsequent modeling, um, or a custom or, you know, ad hoc software package like uh, Backsend or any number of other modeling softwares. And it's a pretty big stretch to expect them to re to, to integrate that into uh, the system that we have. So I, I, I can see that that kind of limits the number of users that either want to work with us and kind of go through the effort of porting their stuff into to a system compatible with this, or working around the fact that it's under the hood composed of six separate computers, each driving four of the monitors that we are looking at. So there's nothing stopping you from logging onto one of those computers and opening up ArcMap, but it's a pretty awkward interface for a uh, group situation. Um, and so a lot of those applications that people are natively modeling, and it'd be nice if there was uh, a more seamless way to uh, control those. Um, we've also had quite a few headaches with just uh, IT maintenance on this system. So things like software updates and hard drives that go bad and video cards that die and on and on and on. Um, it can be quite a, uh, uh, a challenge to keep all six of those computers uh, up and running so that when a group comes in and suddenly, you know, one, one bank of the biz wall doesn't turn on, that, you know, can be a little bit of a distraction um, for a group uh, situation. And then the, the fact that the, uh, the biz wall was um, built piecemeal by us. Um, about five years ago, and so there's certain things about it um, that can be kind of awkward in a group setting. One, one is that the 24 monitors that we're using give off quite a bit of heat, and so that, that can be less than ideal uh, depending on what the, the AC in that room is, is, is doing on a given day. Um, and so some of these, I think, you know, we have a plan to uh, correct them and hopefully um, moving forward make them less of an issue so that we can bring in more groups um, and have them use the facility um, 
with lots of those technical challenges, and that's what I'm going to go over now. Um, so the, the, the first thing that we're going to do is replace the current biz wall with a commercial visualization wall that has very narrow bezels between screens, fewer larger screens, and all of the power and processing on these on this new VizWall will actually be stored outside of the RAM room in a telecom closet. So it'll be climate controlled. There won't be clutter. It'll be a very nice, clean interface. Um, and then even more importantly, we're going to be moving from the six current computers to a single high-end uh, gaming computer that has multiple uh, GPUs or graphics cards to drive the entire VizWall as one high-resolution desktop or, um, you know, maybe subdivided and people could have, uh, you know, one person's laptop on these four and then the gaming computer on these six. So it'll be a flexible configuration of how that's used, but it won't be the overhead that it currently is of logging into multiple computers and trying to do something across them. You can kind of use this with, with no um, expert knowledge on, you know, setting up a, a server, or, uh, connecting to multiple computers. It will be just like logging into a desktop and you could uh, display your visualization or output uh, however you'd like on that. Um, and, and the way that we've got this um, set up to be configured, you, you'll also be able to like, have multiple people in the room interacting with the data on this wall through a uh, program called Sage. So they would you know, go to their uh, browser, log to a URL, and then they could share their screen on, on one portion, um, kind of use their cursor to, to, to move and, and resize screens on other portions. So but hopefully a very, a much more user-friendly and extensible platform for visualization. Uh, along with that, we have a, a plan to reconfigure the layout of the current RAM room. Um, currently, we've got multiple small areas. We've got the main table and then what we saw in some of those other uh, images, and the visual on one wall, and the projector on the other, and this is the main uh, workspace that we use. But we also have a, a little breakout area, lounge area, and some workstations along here. But typically, these do not get used extensively in a RAM session. So what we want to do um, is reconfigure this with the large visual uh, along the wall, get rid of all of the devices, reconfigure the workstations to go along the west uh, sidewall, and then have just the one central space uh, to kind of engage uh, people more fully and also allow for more people to use the facility uh, in one session. Uh, and then along, and we are running late, so I'm going to uh, breeze through this. But the uh, we'd also, at the same time, like to implement a more uh, integrated compute cluster so that we can tie in to existing um, compute infrastructure on site, but then also use off-site uh, USGS cloud resources. Um, and I could ask, I could answer more details if anyone's curious about that, but I will uh, move on to the final section of this presentation. Great. And thanks, uh, uh, Brian, Amanda, and, and Colin for the, the information. Now, sort of, I wanted to kind of close with the, the advertisement of saying, you know, the, the RAM is open for use or for clients to come to us. Uh, like I was saying, Meredith McClure and Steve Hostetler kind of came in and used it. Uh, there's a possibility of Powell groups coming through. Uh, anyone really kind of interested in using it, uh, you can reach out to me or we can put you in touch with the people at the Fort Collins Science Center uh, who, who does actually own and manage the room. But the general workflow is kind of like you contact us, the Fort Collins Science Center here in, in Fort Collins, the USGS Center, and the, or, or the North Central Climate Science Center. We have a preliminary discussion. This is usually a phone call, a group phone call about what are the objectives, what's going on existing, and then what is the possible use of the RAM. And then if it turns out, you know, it's kind of a fork there in the road after the first two things happen to say if the RAM can be used, well then we start on working to ingest the relevant data. 
uh, maybe some preliminary visualizations and analysis going back and forth, and this is kind of email or maybe another group call or something. Uh, and then, you know, once some things are refined, then you extend maybe a little bit wider group, uh, and that group will depend on exactly the objectives of the analysis, bring those people into the RAM, come together, do that iteration like Amanda had showed in that graphic of refining the objectives, expanding the knowledge, co-producing some information, and then incorporate that output you know, kind of into the project. As Colin said, there's that kind of before and after that goes through with it. But that's that's kind of a general framework, and you know, I think that it, it, each of these might have a quite a bit different flavor depending on who's involved as far as, you know, if somebody's got scanned field notes from their hard copy, uh, that might be the relevant data we're ingesting, and it could be a machine-to-machine -machine handshake that Colin and somebody at the geodata portal, say, for example, are getting those data in there. And then, you know, who's to invite? You know, is this the technical people who are doing the programming, and they're going to have a real in-depth session on that program, or is it land managers? And you got to think about kind of how you queue up and get ready for the various groups coming in. But in general, that's kind of the process. So we'll stop there. When a little bit over, but maybe I'll open up for questions for that, and then we'll hear from the foundational science areas. But first, any questions on kind of the RAM and what we just presented? So, a question from Amanda on the video. The video analysis is, I think, quite intriguing. If you, how much time did it take you to go through the 10 hours of video, and and how much time did it take for the coding process um, up front? Um, as did the analysis. Yeah, so the the coding itself was actually pretty quick once I had it transcribed. Um, it took a while to transcribe it. I transcribed it myself because initially I had planned on doing what's called a content log, which isn't full transcription, it's list of topics. And then I found I wanted detailed transcription. Um, so you could outsource some of that by having it professionally transcribed. Um, but I think in this case, it was kind of evolving. Um, but it, I mean, it was still reasonable in this case that it was 10 hours of video. Um, so Three days of transcription? Probably a week of transcription. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then another, I don't know. Three days to go back through it and code. Um, then once it's coded, then the analytics is kind of automated, right? Well, like the, against the transcription. Yeah. So the the coding and the analysis are pretty iterative, because yes, you can query and you can pull out, um, but with this, the, like I had done an initial coding and none of workshop flow things were in there. And I just, on that second coding, I saw, well, this objective thing is really interesting. And that was when I decided I needed to do this minute by minute thing in order to see this, because I wanted to see what this looks like. Okay. So yeah, it's that kind of iteration of making sure you've got the right code, going back to the literature, saying, well, I'm seeing humor. Are other people seeing that, or is this something I'm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Six color codes, what are they associated with? They actually, yeah, so they, they go back to this graphic. Okay. Um, so a little bit, in the, pa in the paper we that's been reviewed, they're, they're kind of adjacent, kind yeah. of figure eight, okay. one A and B. So that, that sort of is why we kind of, that, that the colors do match that. Okay, good point. It's like it, it makes it something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions on the RAM? So when is the fancy new RAM 2.0 coming? Um, well, we're still um, kind of figuring out details, but we think we're going to put a bid out on that BizWall um, probably first of the fiscal year, so October 1st-ish. Okay. So cool. it'll probably be late late fall by the time we get it implemented. Thanks. And what's the current price? <laughs> that sort of depends on who you ask, I think. Yeah. Probably on the order of 50 days? 50 to 80, I think, is kind of the ballpark. Okay. Okay. Well, before, and it wasn't when we did that do it yourself system, they were more like 100 plus, 150, and so we did our own. And the current biz wall is 
under that, on the order of 20 to 40K maybe with the various monitors, and, but you know, untold number of hours of maintenance and, and, and uh, kind of reinvigorating. So that uh, I think that investing, uh, they come down a little bit in price in that commercial office out shelf system is going to be worthwhile. So um, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, I, I thought this workflow diagram that was presented was really, really cool. And, you, and if I got you right, Jeff, you said there's a publication that's either being produced or in process or whatever. Is that correct? Yeah, in review. In review. Okay, great. I'll send you an email about that if I could. And it's a second round, so I'm hoping that you know we kind of got uh, major revisions requested, brought in Amanda to do a lot of the major revisions, and it's a, it is a review, but second round, so I'm hoping that maybe we, it, it comes through. We'll see. Well, I'll spill my beans a little bit here and say I think this diagram is really important because when we come up with these frameworks for doing climate adaptation, we kind of say, you know, define your objectives and go back and revisit them and do this stuff. And it's always presented like this circle or this, you know, as you mentioned, linear process. And anybody who's been involved with it knows that what you see in that that uh, graphic that you have there is, is you know, what happens. And I just think that's really cool. And that's a, a, a really, really neat way of displaying kind of that process and so much more powerful than those of us just saying, well, it's, you know, it's presented linearly, but you'll have to revisit it. And so I think that if we could, you know, use that in some of the guidance that's coming out, um, that would be a really, really neat thing. So I really, really like the work that you've done there and the way that it's presented. And a thanks to, uh, to Marion for producing the figure uh, yeah. based on Amanda's code. But thanks, John, for that. Well, whoever did it, I think the team, I mean, obviously it's a group effort, but it's it's just really a nice piece of work. Yeah, great. Um, thanks. Okay, let's uh, switch gears just really quickly uh, on the, the any any major comments for the foundational science areas or the funded projects. I noticed the spreadsheets seem to be well uh, updated that we ask people to enter information. The only thing I saw needed from the foundational science area was MTS, no, um, not MTS, Arjun having a question related to some downscale climate. I think there's iteration on email with, uh, with Marion on that. Uh, we could maybe take it on offline, but uh, I thought that the ball was in Arjun's court to further refine exactly what was needed on that climate data. But Arjun, perhaps me, you, Marion, and or MTS could, could go offline with that, unless there's something kind of quickly to be uh, thrown out here. And I'd open it up to any other quick updates as we're kind of close to the hour. So uh, this is Andy, uh, Jeff. Maybe I could just briefly mention uh, I think you might have seen that um, we had a book come out, an edited book that many many of the of the Climate Science Center folks were involved with, um, basically in climate change in uh, on public lands in the Rockies and the Appalachians. And I just wondered about opportunities to post a listing for that on the in the newsletter or on the website or. Otherwise, try to um, spread the word to uh, ESC folks that might be interested in it. That would be great. We've got a newsletter coming up. The focus for the next round is climate, but we all, you know, we certainly let uh, you know other updates to come through. Lindsay Middleton is the contact. I don't know if you've seen anything from her, you could dig that up, or you could feel free to just send it to maybe Dennis, myself, and sure Lindsay sees that. That's a great thing to to put up. And I thought we put a, a news item on ESC already, but. Let's double check on that. Yeah, I thought we tweeted something on that or set out something on our uh, social network. Anyway, we'll we'll highlight it in a number of different ways. We'll also probably push it up to the um, headquarters, I guess the, the, the national office, so that they can um, spread it around that network as well. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, let's get the word out on that good work. It's, uh, Andy, and this is Leanne. I think I have that um, posted on your project page too, if I recall correctly, on the NCCWS website. Unless I remember posting a book, but if it was a very recent one, um, it may not be out there. And we now have links for where to where to purchase it and so forth that we probably ought to get on there. Okay. Yeah. So should I send you the uh, that information? Yes, please. Okay, great. 
If you CC me too, and this is Jack, I'll make sure Lindsay sees it. Oh, good. If there's any other who's not, if she hasn't been introduced on a telecom, it's the communications person for the North Central Climate Science Center now. And Andy, which one of your projects is this for? Which one, or would it be covered under all? Well, it involves both the uh, impacts and the and the white bark pine. Okay. Okay, uh, we only got a couple minutes left. I don't know if MTS or Dennis want to talk about the physical climate or the adaptation mitigation. Um, on the adaptation, just the uh, reminder that we have a workshop scheduled um, at the end of August, first of September, two-day workshop. Okay. And I saw at MTS, thanks for the update for that, the, client, the client, physical climate being highlighted in the newsletter. I saw that information. Uh, appreciate that. Um, sure. um, the only other thing I would like to add is, you know, I'll be attending this workshop uh, in uh, the Wind River Reservation on the drought project. And uh, I have an intern this summer who's helping out with analysis of, uh, you know, snow and stream flow data in the region. So, you know, we're getting some interesting results, which I hope to show there, it, uh, to the group there and also kind of talk about uh, the Eddy index and also Gabriel's index and kind of how can we use that together to kind of have a better assessment of early drought warning. So something that, of course, can scale up to other regions as well, but uh, something I plan to do at the workshop. And probably just a couple other things just for general notes. In the way of job opportunities, I think the USDA Climate Hub is still open, or is that closed now? It's closed. I'm okay, sure. or is it the 26th? Okay. Yeah. Oh well. So stay tuned. Um, and then Rudy Schuster is advertising for a social scientist mm -hmm. um, to work. I'm not sure, exactly sure on what scope of things, but I think economic analysis is part of it. Um, so anyway, if, if anyone knows someone wants to work in that realm or just contact Rudy or Nina um, yeah. looking for someone. And this is related to the Eco Drop project and sure. coordination coordinating that uh, Eco Drop Actionable Science Working Group that we're trying to uh, do through the North Central, but it's kind of a national initiative. Okay, I think uh, we're on the hour. Uh, if any others have to communicate, there, we do have our monthly spreadsheet. You can check the spending levels that people have come down to and uh, any other updates. We look to that. I uh, have Lindsay do that for the publications and the, uh, the updates, and then foundational science needs can take offline. Uh, but thanks for joining, and uh, next month, I believe, we're going to have Marion Talbert highlighting the uh, the, the, the Kind of climate graphics that she's been working on through an R shiny web type of tool. I think it's quite an advanced uh, uh, mechanism to plot climate data. Uh, pretty exciting way to to do that in a in a, in a way that sort of gives a lot more uh, uh, information. I think that the kind of standard web tools, and we're pretty excited about that. It's been a popular uh, kind of uh, tool uh, when people do find out about it and then work with us. So generically uh, or generally kind of show that to, to everybody uh, at the next monthly check-in and uh, there'll be some notices sent out on that. Uh, and until then, I guess uh, everybody enjoy the uh, 4th of July Independence Day weekend and uh, their summer. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Part of Ram Community.